Well, good afternoon, everybody. Panel, great job. Really good work laying out the foundation for the discussion this afternoon. We call this a panel, but it really is a discussion. And we're fortunate to have experts sitting on that side of the table. So we can answer any question you have. And if we can't, Dr. Pritchett will answer the question. So anyway, so what we'll do is we'll open it up. And if you can just raise your hand, we'll have, we have virtual um, participants. Are you following me around, Jan? What are we doing here? It's a, okay. okay. So I'll, I'll step out in front here if I'm getting in your way. Anyway, so, so, um, so we'll have a, a discussion. So you guys can just raise your hand and I'll come out with the mic and we'll have our panelists um, chime in. And then we'll be going to uh, Paula for questions from the virtual audience as well. Um, the important thing is that you really should ask questions. You don't want me asking all the questions all afternoon. So anyway, um, so what I'll do is I just want to remind you that, you know, we're talking about regenerative ag and in a sense what that really means. And you've heard a lot of really good information and what you've also heard is we don't really have a definition. And we don't really want a definition at this point. I think what we want to use is regenerative ag as a framework for solving really the critical challenges that we have as, uh, as a college of agriculture and as a university. So we'll get that and we'll eventually develop some sort of common ground for talking about agriculture and the future of agriculture around regenerative themes. Okay, so first question gets, oh, here we go, Dr. Grandin, here you go. Oh, well, I'd like to be here. Okay, the thing I wanted to ask you is I'm, I'm very interested in grazing. I've been in this industry for 50 years and watched it get attacked, and that's why I wrote a paper about grazing, uh, re reviewing the literature. Now, a, a study just came out of Stanford from satellite data saying that if you do cover crops, you get 5% less corn or 3% less soybeans. Now, that study would not have put the uh, livestock into the equation. I want to ask you, hopefully, we put the livestock into the equation that will solve the problem that that Stanford study came up with. Who wants to tackle that? Anybody want to take that on? Right, here we go, Stephen first, and we'll go down the list. Yeah, so I've actually been part of several different studies here in Colorado looking at, uh, first off, if you graze cover crops or not, and what the impact is for soil health, and it doesn't seem like there's much negative impact, at least. That's what I saw. Yeah. I reviewed the literature. Well, my grazing paper, that's what I saw. And then I saw this this uh, Stanford study blasted all over my Google feed. <laughs> and, and I'm uh, going, yeah, but they that satellite wouldn't have told you whether it had livestock on it or not. So I got to thinking that ought to be the, the main difference. Uh, and then I just to finish up with, we've also looked at the economics a bit and says if you, you know, the weight gain from on your animals from, from that grazing or if you um, cut some of the cover crop for, for feed, you know, as forage. That, that the livestock, you know, then I went to a seminar like before, before COVID shut everything down. They said you have to graze cover crops for every crop. I was in South Dakota. Yeah, so that, that seems to be a good solution, but I don't know. But I didn't like that study. I'm afraid a lot of and, and Kim, do, Kim, anything? Okay. Yeah, and... <laughs> and and one of the tenets of 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 the uh, of the regenerative uh, culture is actually integrating animals into our landscapes and into our cultural system. So let's keep that in mind when we start talking about being able to make measurable sort of uh, uh, things when we talk about uh, regenerative ag. Questions? Next question. Anybody behind me? Come on, you gonna make me ask the next question? Jan's not gonna ask the question. Okay, I'll ask the question. So let me ask you. Oh, go ahead. We'll we'll have John. John. Say who you are, too. Oh, John Sheehan. I'm actually part of Ag Next. Um, so I, I'm an engineer by training, and I um, look the other way whenever somebody shows me something that says it's regenerative. You'll get what you more of what you want, and we'll put things back in. And the engineer in me says, well, I don't see how this adds up. So today, we hit 8 billion people in the population. So it's an interesting day for us to have this discussion. How do we deal with the fact that we're kind of saying, hey, there's intensive agriculture, and then there's this regenerative agriculture. Is it going to end up um, sort of opposed to um, opportunities for increasing production for food at a time when we're still looking at, at people who need food and populations are growing? So I, I, I guess I part of my question is um, a, a bit of a frustration with we've got a new term 
that I think a lot of people are going to feel skeptical about. That's great. That's a great question. Anybody want to look at Francesca first? So in the studies we have done, for sure, if you look like at um, uh, wheat uh, follow systems, the the once in a uh, two years time that wheat is grown, it has a higher production than when you integrate it in a continuous rotation. But then when you add the wheat crop with the legume crop with the other cereal crops all together, once you intensify and you diversify the rotation, you actually have a higher productivity so I don't think that any of the big crop like wheat corn or soybean um, uh, will, 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 will never match that that yields done in a very industrial um, in conventional production system but if we all together modify a little bit our diet and diversify them and start eating different cereals, um, now, uh, all, all, all of we can produce actually more food with regenerative and also we can have a more resilient uh, um, production so that you have less year to uh, year variability in yields and you have also better adaptation to climate change. So I think that all together, uh, if anything, regenerative rat will sustain food production into the future for unfortunately 8 billion people. Right. Any others want to chime in? Yeah, thank you. Uh, John, when you brought up the difference between sort of intensive and extensive, my brain immediately went to some re a research project um, that we're doing in partnership with Dr. Leach um, with some agrovitaics work out in feedyard systems. So actually bringing solar agrovitaics into confined animal production. Um, and not that it's regenerative in the traditional sense. And I do think that I, I appreciate how um, flexible we've remained in the definition of regenerative because I think that that's a unique example where confined animal systems may actually be more um, of a solution for an agrovitaics um, type project and in that notion the cattle also are provided shade right so the adapted capacity as as the climate um, potentially warms or if we are able to allow those solar um, we've had discussions in the department of around having those solars um, be able to adjust. Could they also dub as a windbreak? Um, and then on top of that, can we actually encourage animals th from a behavior standpoint to congregate, and they do congregate, we know that, um, under shade, but how does that actually make manure removal easier, better, and faster for dry manure digestion and the development of renewable natural gas, right? So I think, I think it's more of a challenge to allow ourselves to get creative, right? And to bring in these different solutions. Um, it's very expensive. This technology is very expensive, as Mark and Jan know very well. So we, we may, you know, it may not be scalable yet, but I think that that's a good example um, of maybe not a traditional, how they would define regenerative principle type practice, but certainly falls within the flexible definition um, of the college and is, I think, really suitable. Um, um, with that, yeah, right, and I think I think this point is well taken. That I think regenerative is we're not looking at systems that were in the past. We're looking at creating new systems. So if you had told me 20 years ago that a confined feeding operation is an essential part of regenerative ag, I would have said, well, but. If you're looking at the nutrition of the animal, you're looking at the genetics of the animal, you're looking at energy generation, you're looking at fuel efficiencies, it's a part of it at some scale, right? So that's what regenerative does. It allows us to look forward, not to go back to the horse and plow. That's not the idea. It's to think of things new, and we have new boundary conditions. 21st century, it's a completely different game now. We've never been sustainable. Agriculture's never been sustainable, ever. Not once. Because you're mining nutrients, you're using fuel, all of these things. So regenerative at least gives us the potential to move forward from that system. Yeah. Anybody else? Questions? Come on. You're going to make me do this? Oh, here we go, Paula. Oh, is your question online? Oh, okay. There you go. <laughs> Um, yes, this is a question from Yan Bing Ma, at, who is a research scientist at our Arkansas Valley Research Center. Your question. If we're thinking in the frame of regenerative agricultural systems, if the ag system has been damaged, how can we rebuild it to arable farmland with very limited irrigation water? 
I know it is a hard question to answer, but what can we do from soil health, animal science, or agricultural science standing points? Okay, great. Anybody? Print, take that on. Cover crop people or Francesca. Francesca, go ahead. You start it off. Well, we need inputs, um, and so you know you, you you need to start by importing some inputs. Biochar, if it's very dry and compacted, could be an op an option for sure. Compost manure. So you, you need to start by investing, and and you know in a way with the engineeristic mind, we cannot produce from nothing. We have to have some inputs to regenerate. But then you can keep. The, the, the system to start and at that point you can start practices uh, that can um, uh, in, uh, improve the water infiltration and the retention and so have all the positive feedback along the way and you can start having different crops in there so but I, I would start from soil amendments. Okay, Kim, let's go down. Yeah, so um, I'm not an expert in this space, but we have experts on our in our group looking at um, the genetic capacity um, and cattle origin as um, um, a particular opportunity to allow animals to adapt not only to a changing climate but to drier climates. Um, and so there's been work that has been done by um, people in our group, one of whom is in the room, Dr. Ritten is here. Um, looking at cattle who are moved south, um, so from Nebraska, for example, into the northern Great Plains, and compared to animals who are sourced locally, those cattle do not gain as well. So from a performance standpoint, um, they don't do as well. Last summer, we actually measured methane on those animals, and there's a significant methane difference um, as well. Now, there's lots of theories about why, right? Like, wh why would cattle seek of the same breed, but of, that were, that were born in a different place and grew up in a different place, why would they have a different ability to acclimate or adapt to a new region? We, we're not certain, um, but potentially a climate smart practice, especially in the arid west, could be to source um, animals locally, for example, or to utilize other technology like precision fence technology rather than um, building fences so that you can direct cattle to different parts of an operation during different seasons with different growing um, types of forage, et cetera, et cetera. And so um, I appreciate that there was a notion that it's a very hard question to answer. I think a lot of us are worried about this particular question, um, but I do hope that innovation and, and technology and um, answering even further questions will be able to help us. I can also say like in this, uh, what I showed in my presentation is that we can also bring in the macros into this perspective because some of our studies have shown that with agriculture, we have lost the connection between the beneficial effect of micro with the plant. And one of the examples was that in some of our systems which are intensively managed, we are seeing a loss of mycorrhizae. And mycorrhizae is important for water retention and also for the carbon sequestration. So in one of our studies, we have put the mycorrhizae back into the system and we are seeing an increase in the soil quality and also the ability of the system to provide resilience against the drought. So there are different ways in which we can like you know kind of try to start to build in the quality soils which can lead us to the climate resilience. Pankaj, I have a question for you. So I'm I'm not done yet, but I want to ask a question. Anyway, so um so so let me ask you this. So you, you did, you, you showed your, those, those astonishing numbers of the, the biomass of microorganisms. So is there, do you believe there's the potential to manage the microbiome? How would you do that? Well, that's a great question. I was expecting it. So one thing is like, there can be many different ways. So one thing, what is, what we have found is the best way to manipulate a microbiome is through the changes in the management practices. And actually we can steer the microbiome to the desired like state. So some of our studies actually we have done a study with uh, C. Fonte where we have uh, different residues and those different residues can steer the soil microbial community towards a particular state. So that's one option. The other option what is like if there's something missing as I talked about microarchy, then we have a particular like microbial inoculant which we can provide to the system. The problem was like uh, a few years ago they were kind of like a snake oil. 
So people have used it, all the, all the growth have used it one time, but they didn't see any significant impact like for longer term periods. But now we have changed the technology. Now we have tools or methods to make those microbial consortium stick to the system and can also provide benefits. Questions more? So somebody was over here with a hand up? Here we go, Dr. Grandin again. Well, I gotta make some comments about cattle. The thing is, is that the animal that produces really well in the feed yard, you can't, it's got a big sister, you can't support out on a Eastern Colorado ranch. See, that's the thing. Uh, what I found driving around in the country, and I've been doing that, uh, you need a small red Angus cow for eastern Colorado. Then as you go into Nebraska, eastern Nebraska, uh, you get more and more hay. I see the hay, and you've got bigger cattle. You know, so this is the thing. You've got to have the right cattle for the right place. The other thing we got to look at is all the arid land that you can only graze. That's a different kind of crop ro uh, pasture rotation situation. And when people complain about how much land cattle takes up, well, they forget about all this land that you can't crop. So how do we raise food on it? 20% of the habitable earth. I looked it up. That's a conservative estimate. So there's like the right kind of cattle for different places. Thank you. Thank you okay. very much. Questions? Here we go. Oh, okay. Your name? <laughs> My name is Grace Hockley. Um, I'm an undergraduate here in the horticulture department. Um, my question is, as we see places towards the west starting to dry up, do you think sustainable, like looking sustainability-wise, is it better to put in those inputs to the soils, try and make them great areas for production, or should we just move away from them and go to more suitable states and areas, the U.S.? Like, should we focus on getting this irrigation and all this water here, or should we just kind of reinvest somewhere else? All right. So there's the question between using the green water and the blue water, right? Okay. Jordan, you should handle this question. There we go. <laughs> Perfect. It's a challenging question, and I think that um, the answer is that there isn't one system that's going to work in every location, and, and that different um, areas and communities have to be able to adapt to the resources that they're endowed with, and there are areas that are using resources at a rate that exceeds what they've been endowed with and what can regenerate. So. Um, while changes, uh, I think, are necessary, um, I don't, I don't know that that means that we just abandon agriculture. Right? It, it just means that agriculture has to look different, uh, depending on the location, depending on the resource base, depending on the climate, um, and, and as the climate changes. So, uh, yeah, excellent question. Anybody else? Oh, Troy. Troy, do you have a question? Oh, a point to her. Okay. Hey, I was going to ask you a question, Jordan. Is there any any sort of? Um, I mean, you're dealing with. I mean, one of our major problems now is this idea of buy and dry, right? We're losing agricultural land because we don't have water. Um, is there any any sort of attempts in your research or you see in the regenerative space to look at monetizing gr green water? You know, I mean, water that's stored in the landscape. I was wondering if there was anything that you guys have thought about. Well, you know, the buy and dry essentially is, is where um, communities are, are purchasing agricultural water rights and, and making farms in, in Indian communities essentially unviable um, in, in the longer term. So I think there's a lot of work uh, thinking of thinking creatively about solutions that can keep water uh, on the ag landscape, um, maybe in more limited quantities. Uh, but maintain those those landscapes as viable uh, agricultural uh, economies, and and so um, I know that we have work in the department, Dan Mooney and others that have looked um, at some of these creative uh, alternative transfer mechanisms and, and things of the sort that uh, again don't transfer the entire water right to to cities, but keep a lot of those water rights in the ag communities um, and, and make sure that the water is used more flexibly. Great. More questions? Anybody else? Audience? Here we go. Here we go. This is what I wanted to do all day. <laughs> Bill Donahue, but you're too young for that. Anyway, Brad. Yeah. Uh, uh, my name is Jane. I'm a poster from Pankis Group. And I have a question. I think it's very simple, but maybe a difficult to understand. What's the difference between the regenerative agriculture system and the sustainable agriculture system? I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to give that to somebody on the panel, I think. Anyway. So what would you say, in your own opinion, what's the difference between, I'm just going to Stephen Fonte this, regenerative versus sustainable? 
Yeah, I think that my understanding, at least, is that regenerative um, has is a more recent term that has taken these sort of five principles of, you know, a living root and permanent soil cover and reduced disturbance and all that. And sustainable is a much more broad term that can mean a lot of different things to a lot of different people. And um, yeah, and I think it's a bit of an older term as well. So I think, I mean, regenerative is maybe becoming that as well. Maybe we're doing that to regenerative. <laughs> I'd say um, rather than just simply sustaining the system for and, and into future generations, regenerative adds to that and aims to then uh, make the system that produced it better than when you started, improve upon the soils, improve upon the water resources. And I think uh, the college website, to put in a plug for that, um, does a really good job of integrating those words and suggesting where there are gaps and where regenerative can fill in those gaps or those weaknesses to, again, not just sustain going forward, but sustain and improve, regenerate, and make better. Great. Anybody else? Jordan? Yeah. Yeah, you know, I, I see regenerative as a systems-based approach, whereas sustainability uh, is more of a practice-based approach, so you can have individual practices that are sustainable or not sustainable, but the system itself can, um, is regenerative in nature. And I think it's, it's an interesting question going forward, um, not just how we perceive it, but how consumers uh, in the marketplace, perceive of sustainable practices versus uh, regenerative systems, and, and what value they place on that in the terms of the products that they purchase. And so, it's an interesting area for future research. Great, Francesca, you, you want to say something? I, I, I totally agree uh, with Mark. I like regenerative because, to me, includes sustainability and encompasses it and adds to it. Right. And the example I gave the other day was, do you want a regenerative marriage or a sustainable marriage? <laughs> <laughs> so is your marriage sustainable or regenerative? I'm not answering you know that. that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to pick up from this guy. In the, in the animal agriculture space, I actually think it's opposite. So regenerative seems to be um, more... Um, implemented um, where soils are involved, right? And um, in animal agriculture, of course, it extends much beyond that um, through processing and into retail and um, into consumption and et cetera, et cetera. And so in in our specific field, um, sustainability tends to be the broader um, and would incorporate things like team member health and safety, for example, um, and is one that we see um, ESG, environmental, social, and governance, um, 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 other reporting standards that large corporations are required to do, banks and finance are still in the ESG sustainability space. So in our world, I think our, our nexus is a bit... The animal agriculture space is more connected to larger companies and more top-down, um, potential top-down mandates. And so in our space, sustainability is the broader. Regenerative is a bit more pra practice-based, five principles, people starting to try to brand that and um, bring things um, into it that are a little bit different. So I think it's just, it's very dependent on, on the space that you're in, which is why I think the animal team appreciates the flexibility um, in the regenerative definition that the College of Okay, a question back here. I got two questions. Where was the one question over here? Let me get him first and I'll get the. Yeah, here we go. Okay. Thanks. Here you go. Uh, all right. AJ Brown, Soil and Crop Sciences with the Ag Water Quality Program. Hi, everyone. Um, <laughs> my question is, is actually more about maybe it's the entomology. It might get philosophical very fast, but regenerative ag to me, the word regenerative implies healing. And so I'd like to take it back to the case study that Jordan mentioned about Crowley County and, and you know, selling water rights. I drove that this morning, and that's why I'm here in my field clothes today, actually. And so it got me thinking about maybe if the panel could provide me a case study example of how one might regenerate an area like that's been affected where the water no longer exists, that, that option's kind of off the table, yet we see desertification between Crowley County all the way to Lyman, Colorado, a significant significant area where ranching and rangeland exists, but you know, is that the case there? What would you go about to make that a regenerative system? Okay, I'm looking at somebody. Give me a good luck here. Here we go. Monte, here we go. Steve, you want nobody? Come on. <laughs> I'll start at least. I don't know that I have the answer for you, but um, 
I don't, I mean, honestly, when you're drying, going from irrigated to dry land, you're never going to regenerate it to the, the soils at that same level of soil carbon, for example, and, you know, biology there. But I think we can see examples within one of those contexts where we have dry land agriculture. Francesca talked about intensifying it. We do restore carbon. We restore um, soil function and water and, and biology of the soils through just uh, growing more crops or, or doing whatever we can to, to increase yeah, I wish I had the answer for Crowley County, um, but I think that I think that there's a lesson to be learned there, right? And, and the lesson is that if we take water off the landscape, we have to think about what the landscape is going to look like going forward. And, and so I focus a lot on programs that that pay uh, to extinguish uh, uh, water rights in groundwater systems, and if those water rights come off the land with, with nothing done, right, it's going to be desertification. So we have to think about maintaining some water to get native crops, uh, native plants established so that the landscape actually looks like a native landscape, not like a desert. Yeah. I would just consider bringing the economics into it, not as a non economic. Uh, another farm income revenue stream could be from thinking about energy and, and again, far more than the farm itself uh, needs, but feeding back onto the grid and having that be an economic resource that gets infused in to begin that process, eventually, and using that agricultural resource in a different way. And we don't have a sociologist on the panel, but um, the strength of those rural communities, right, to adapt and get through that huge change, I think is oftentimes what we don't um, think about. And I think, you know, we um, talked a lot about human behavior and their ability to adapt from an economics component or, you know, whatever. But these rural communities are exceptionally important to maintaining the landscape and our food security. Um, so I think we also have to keep that um, in mind when we're thinking about these regenerative systems, right? It may not be one of the five principles, but people, people matter. Yeah, just the, the second we had a, a case down in Crowley, remember where the, the landowners came in and as you're pointing out, we don't want it to be, you know, a kosher plantation, right? So the idea is to get some system in place that transitions out of those. And regenerative, I think, allows for that. Like, I think I think you might need a boost of water. You might need to keep water on the land for four or five years before you can establish a crop for grazing or putting in a perennial wheat or something like that. But I think that's the sort of mindset that we should be thinking of. Question over here. Uh, Paula, I promise I'll get them. Oh, I'm sorry. Paula's waiting. Let me get Paula. She's been waiting. You're next. Well, it's, again, it's it's not me. I represent Perry Cabot. I understand that. <laughs> From our Western Colorado Research Center. Um, and Perry is part of a team uh, that's looking at doing a proposal to uh, Jan's program the solutions uh, to Colorado commodity challenges. They're thinking of studying the benefits and impacts of short-term grazing since we have lots of landowners in the area that are willing to let producers graze their land. Dang, we have lots of sheep over here. <laughs> I don't have a good definition of short term, but this phrase is in the literature. So if it rings any bells, does anyone have any advice or direction on the short term grazing plus regenerative ag space? Perry, we've given them permission to sort of have sheep over there. So they're doing that. So anyway, um, any, Kim, any, anything? Say yeah. yeah, measure, 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 right? Because you might be defining it. Right. Um, I would say, I don't know if it, Francesca would know better if others had done it, but I would say measure anything that you can. Right. Jan, you might have to up the budget. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm not at all uh, familiar with the short-term grazing, but I've seen it in uh, in uh, regenerative uh, operations in Kansas, where they have the animal coming for a few hours to terminate a crop, uh, and then they move them over, and they seem to be very effective also at actually uh, bringing fertility in, because they kind of, you know, spray uh, with fertilizer, <laughs> with natural... Uh, you yeah, and, and they've had examples in California from fire mitigation bring goats in to graze down things and that's considered a short-term you know high-powered sort of approach here's a question over here 
Uh, my name is Federico. I'm a research scientist in AgBio. Uh, and my question is kind of beyond the data. We are trying to um, set a new system and changing something that has been rooted for decades in some communities. What is the communication aspect of this? Is it going to be all data driven? Is it going to be how do you engage farmers into thinking that this is going to be a good long term uh, change? So, really, how do you engage your stakeholders? How are you guys doing that? And what, maybe what, what, maybe along with that, what are some of the challenges you guys are having with engaging stakeholders? Francesca? Or? I don't know. Yesterday yeah. I was at a dinner and sitting close to a, um, a producer and uh, he said, you know, go and ask who are the leaders in those communities and start working with them. Start suggest them to have in farm practice and demonstration and, and, and that will spin to the entire, to the entire community for sure um it's now i think all of us we, we even the more geeky scientists we we talk with farmer we ask what they need um and try to uh, uh, to, to work with them and, and, and set up practice and demonstration activity within their own farms and operations and uh, how that, that's how we engage all the way to the technology and think about developing apps on their phone and you know all of what we are thinking I guess yeah, yeah you know, I think that I think that farmers have a long term perspective often and, and you know they think about their family that's going to be on that land in the future they think about their community and when we've asked producers you know why conserve groundwater their answer is never about themselves it's always about the future and, and their 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 kids uh, their community members so I think appealing uh, to, to those uh, ideals but also being cognizant that farmers face short-term constraints as well and so we do need uh, policies that help that help um, get over those short-run constraints so, so that the long-term perspective can be taken into account in the, in the practices and, um, systems that are engaged. Francesca, another one thing. Um, yeah, following off from that, one one thing that came up in the conversation yesterday is the de-risking. So farmers take a risk in the change. Uh, and so we also need to think if we want them to uh, incentivize them to change, we need to think about how do we de-risk that change. And there is not really a good answer to that yet. Okay, I have a question for you. you. You, I mean, you clearly work directly with lots of stakeholders. Not, I mean, so what? What is your biggest challenge? I mean, so you have the climate change thing going on, and you have this idea, of, you know, trying to worry about sustainability and generation of, of different systems. So, what are you seeing as a real challenge in working directly with the stakeholders? We don't have solutions. Right. <laughs> And the solutions haven't been um, tested, which I think is what Francesca is getting at, right? The, this de risk perspective. Um, and the solutions aren't scalable. So everybody knows, right? You can, it has been shown if you feed seaweed to cattle, right? It reduces their emissions. But what never gets published in those papers is that it also decreases animal performance so much that it would cost the producer a dollar a day in loss of animal performance. So the economists in the room are thinking that's a lot of money, right? <laughs> that is like a dollar, a dollar a day from energetics losses. If you look at the hydrogen. So it's when you put it on the solar panels, they're losing no, algae. Yeah. algae. Seaweed. Oh, algae. Yeah, seaweed okay. research that has been done, right? Um, and then there's other questions. So there's this question around how do they afford it, right? And then there's this other question, how do we make that much seaweed? How do we transfer that, transport that much? Right. How do we do that? How do we feed that much seaweed? How do we get it approved through FDA for safe? Da, da, da. And then let's write, and I'm picking on seaweed, it doesn't matter. It's any additive, right? But those are any strategy, any solution. Those are the questions that a, that a producer starts to ask. And then on top of that, we have a research funding challenge. Everybody's aware. It's not just our group. There's less funding for research everywhere. So our ability to answer those questions for them is not as robust. And that's frustrating for them. That's really frustrating. So that's our biggest challenge. And that's, yeah, right. and it's frustrating for everybody. It's hard. Yeah. Okay. More questions. Anybody over here? I actually have a question for um, for Mark. Mark, so so you're you're sitting here now. We've been talking about this sort of regenerative 
approach and you know you come at it from a horticultural standpoint which is a little bit different right because you're looking at an extremely controlled environment in most cases are there any things you're seeing here where you see logical intersections between stuff maybe you're doing and what some of the others are doing I guess my, my gut reaction is um, a lot of the regeneration that we're talking about is it comes back to soils and, and still um, in many, if we think about the tomato acreage in the United States, most of it's soil based. So we can definitely be thinking about my bias is horticultural food crops. So I go to tomatoes as an example. And again, um, still a vast majority is, is soil based. So I think if we're thinking about impact with horticultural crops, um, it could still be in those systems for sure, because that's not like to change for a while. However, there's um, a interest in controlled environments like greenhouses, for example, that can also be integrated with photovoltaics, um, potentially. And those are systems that can use less water and be more efficient on a per acre basis. So there are considerations in that direction. Some are not soil based. And so that is a little bit of a, a question. But um, I think you can think about it both ways. It may not be soil based, but you're saving water in those systems and still producing. Is the still a part of that whole formula? Is, is that still? I don't do that. Much. Good question. Kind of in your home landscape, um, in terms of reducing your water usage by air escaping types of programs and things like that. Yes, I think that's that's part. But uh, then the soils questions also come up. Yep. Which pleases us a lot. <laughs> the soil thing is good, right? Or no? What? Yeah, yeah. Like you know, I would disagree with the idea that we don't know about a lot of the solution. I, I think that there is a lot of the noble technological solution that require more study to be implemented. But there is a lot, and that's where I want to go back to the ancestral. No, there are things, principle that have been done for much before us, integrating legumes in a rotation and bring the nitrogen their way or again, don't till that much. Those are things that are very well demonstrated and there is right. not... Well, and I, and I think... I think I, my... yeah. Right, right. And I, and I think what you'll hear from scientists in many cases is they're really comfortable with ecology now. They didn't used to be, but they'll say ecological principles are really important. But we couldn't have said that 25 years ago. So I think we need to remain as open with regenerative as we did, you know, 20 years ago with the same concepts. Okay, we're up to time. And um, I think I have to turn it over to my distinguished colleague, Jan. <laughs> well, first of all, I want to thank our panelists. Uh, they have worked really hard to get their presentations down to six minutes. <laughs> Not five minutes, five now. Okay. And I want to thank them so much for the, taking the time to do this. Thank you so much. I'd also like to thank Paula Mills, uh, Jean Kelly, and who are not here, Amy Bibby and Anna Gerber, because they made this happen. They really took the time and the effort to make this happen. So thank you. <laughs> remind you that we'll have three seminars next semester. So bring your buddies and your friends to the seminar because they'll be great, just like this one was. And this one sets a really tough act to follow. <laughs> And finally, I want to invite you out for some refreshments to continue the discussion uh, over some food and drink. Thank you.